It was the middle of Wednesday morning, and I was sitting in my car in front of the Piccolo Motel, looking forward to the arrival of my wife, with whom we had lived together for more than three years. At noon, she was supposed to meet Glenn Evesham, her former school friend whom I also knew well, in room 145. It struck me that Glenn was a close friend of mine until recently. It's funny how things work out, isn't it? True love. Ellie was supposed to be my wife, wasn't she? She and Glenn were high school sweethearts and dated all the time. It was Glenn who took her virginity after graduation. I distinctly remember the evening when he bragged about his conquest, proudly talking about how he conquered her. He drove a large Chrysler truck with a spacious bed in an elongated cabin, always prepared blankets and various things in case of spontaneous plans. Glenn was always ready for anything. This jerk was bragging to us about how he did it. It was during a late-night conversation after we all left work. It was that summer, right after we graduated from high school. I still remember his words clearly. He boasted, Guys, I managed to pick her up after graduation. Apparently, she changed into her cousin's prom dress and sported a black Harley Davidson t-shirt and super short jeans. She was undeniably attractive. Long, curly brown hair cascading down her back, striking green eyes and eyelashes that seemed to last forever. She had lovely small breasts and a toned ass. I mentioned that we were heading to a Judd Nelson meeting after graduation, but suggested we take a short break before that. I explained that I wanted to share something important with her. I subtly hinted that I could propose marriage to her. Seeing that she was already on edge, I quietly slipped a couple of pills into her drink to relax her. In the blink of an eye, she was full of energy and desire. When she took off her jeans, I couldn't help but admire her beauty. She sat down on the blanket and tears began to flow. Silent tears were streaming down her face. She was looking at me, waiting for me to speak. I completely forgot what I wanted to say, so I blurted out that I had joined the Navy and would be leaving at the end of next week. I begged her to wait for me, to which she stopped crying and said she would think about it. I walked her home and wished her good night, kissing her before leaving. We never got to Jed's party, where he promised to share one of his ridiculous stories. As always, I lingered on the outskirts of the gathering. Glenn, Ellie, and I were childhood friends, grew up together and went to the same schools, starting from the gymnasium and ending with the middle class. Glenn seemed to have everything, charm, money, athletic talent, and the admiration of all the girls. But despite numerous opportunities, he did not succeed in anything. He was on the football team, but eventually he was expelled, tried to play basketball and was expelled, and in baseball he couldn't hit the ball. Despite his failures, he always had excuses for what did not work out. The coach in football was unpleasant. In basketball, small players constantly elbowed him. And in baseball, he claimed that the referees were stupid. Despite this, he always managed to attract the attention of the girls. He became the prom king in our senior year and was voted the most memorable guy in the yearbook. I also played sports. My name is Wyatt Templeton. I joined the football team, skipped basketball, and was successful on the volleyball team. All four years I was on the lacrosse team in the spring season. It seemed to come down to physical data. Glenn was a big, muscular guy who did weightlifting. On the other hand, I've always been thin. Although I couldn't keep up with the bigger players in football, I was running great. In winter, my coach discovered my talent for jumping, which got me into the volleyball team. Lacrosse remained my main passion, where I played at the center position. Despite Glenn's popularity among girls and the recognition he received, it seemed to me that I was only collecting a bunch of letters. Glenn excelled at hanging out in high school, and I tried my best to keep up. Due to the fact that I grew up in a large family, my mother's old car was the only means of transportation. Although I didn't have many dating opportunities, I made do with what I had. After graduating from high school, Glenn went to Pennsylvania with the financial support of his family, and I stayed and received a partial scholarship to a nearby state university. Although it wasn't enough, and it didn't help me get far. Having committed to teaching in this state for three years, I became a teacher in a public school. 
Accepting this profession meant accepting a modest income, but I remained dedicated to my job, driven by my love for children. Meanwhile, Glenn continued to pursue higher education at the University of Pennsylvania and eventually landed a lucrative position at one of the city's well-known law firms. He boasted of his considerable income, far exceeding mine. When I looked at my watch, I saw that it was already 11.40 p.m., and the end of the working day was approaching. I am determined to find out if I have a wife and family, no matter what it costs me. This situation upsets and disappoints me. Glenn went to Pennsylvania, and I stayed at home. I've always had feelings for Ellie, also known as Ellie Colleen Templeton, formerly Cochran. Ellie graduated from high school and continued her studies at the community college, studying computer programming and software. I have never been able to understand these concepts. Computers are like cars to me. I know the basics, but nothing more. I have enough practicality to take a step back if I encounter something unfavorable. Despite the fact that I have studied a lot of car maintenance materials, I treat them the same way as plumbing. Attempts to fix them only lead to further problems. When we first moved into our house, Ellie needed a new dishwasher, sink, and countertop. After studying and buying the necessary equipment, I decided to install everything myself. Everything seemed simple, but when I tried to do it, I ran into difficulties. I was determined to fix the leaking copper tube, but no matter what I did, it wouldn't stop. Ellie, Daddy's daughter, called her father for help. He arrived and quickly fixed the problem. I remember him patting me on the shoulder and complimenting me on my efforts. Ellie made coffee and we all sat down at the table to enjoy a cup. She expressed pride that I was not indifferent and was trying to solve the problem. Although I felt stupid for not being able to do it myself, I appreciated the praise. It lifted my spirits. Meanwhile, Glenn was studying in Pennsylvania. He earned a reputation for himself, became the president of the fraternity, and a devoted fan of the Nittany Lions. I also made a name for myself by constantly getting on the dean's list every semester after my freshman year, and at the same time managed to work part-time for a whole year. Glenn returned home every summer, using his vacation to surf and chat with numerous women on the beach. Meanwhile, I was focusing on trying to ask Ellie out during the summer holidays between freshman and sophomore years, since we had always been close friends. We have been close friends since childhood, constantly talking and chatting. I've had feelings for her for as long as I can remember. There was a moment in high school when I kissed her and she blushed, and I felt both elation and horror. Kissing Ellie Cochran was a huge achievement. She kissed me back but then asked me not to tell Glenn, and I was disappointed. I almost confessed my love to her until she made me promise not to say anything. It was a moment when I almost made a rash decision, but in the end, I restrained myself. I can't believe how stupid I was. Can you believe that Ellie actually agreed to go on a date with me? When I finally plucked up the courage and asked her out, she agreed. I decided to take her to the chic seafood restaurant The Sailor's Harvest, located outside the city. I wanted to make this evening special, treat her to a nice dinner before going to the city for the play. I thought it would be a cool and memorable evening. And let me remind you, I never claimed to know anything about cars. After buying a used Hyundai with a lot of mileage, the seller assured me that the engine was working properly and would most likely last for another 10 years. He was not mistaken in his words, and in the first two weeks of ownership, the car performed perfectly. Holding Ellie's hand, I couldn't help but admire how amazing she looked in a pale blue mini dress, nylon stockings, and high-heeled shoes. Despite her short stature, Ellie seemed a little taller than me because of her high-heeled shoes. Although I felt a little awkward at first, I soon found myself fascinated by her presence. I've always felt awkward around Ellie. I can chat endlessly on various topics, but whenever I found myself next to Ellie, it was difficult for me to finish a sentence. Her big green eyes mesmerized me, making me freeze when she smiled at me. When I went to her door and talked to her parents while Ellie was packing, I felt them disappear. I walked her to her car, 
helped her into it, and we set off. But about the second third of the way to the restaurant, my newly purchased Hyundai suddenly stalled, putting us in a difficult position. I opened the hood, got out of the car and looked under it, but froze in confusion. I had no idea what the cause of the problem was. Ellie joined me and smiled sympathetically. I had dinner and tickets for the show booked, but the car decided to break down at the most inopportune moment. I looked back at the car feeling frustrated. Ellie reached into her purse, took out her phone, and called her father for help. He arrived about 30 minutes later. He attached an old tire to the front of his car and pushed us towards their house. I was sitting in the car alone and driving the car, and he was pushing. Ellie rode in her father's car while he pulled. I felt like I was stuck between two pieces of bread. We went back to Ellie's house and had a barbecue with her parents and younger brother. Later, we watched an old movie on TV. When we watched Robert Redford kiss Jane Fonda, she mentioned that she had already watched the play Cats. Glenn brought her to New York to watch a play on Broadway, marking my important date with Ellie. Looking at my watch again, I saw that it showed 11.45 p.m. I thought about my actions, wondering why I was in this situation. Deep down, I always knew that Glenn would eventually come back to claim what he considered his prize. I was hoping that Ellie had distanced herself from him, but it seems I was wrong. Remembering our wedding day, I remembered how I tried to persuade Ellie to become my wife. After a bad first date, she decided to try again. It was the end of summer, and the city's carnivals were already in full swing. I couldn't help but remember last year, when Ellie won a beauty contest in our city in her senior year of high school. Despite the rainy weather, she was proclaimed queen on the second evening of the carnival. Glenn was supposed to be there, but for some reason he stayed on the beach. As a result, I became her escort, knowing that I only got this job because she really wanted Clay. Although she didn't talk about it, I understood. He could understand such things. As I said, it was raining outside. It was not just a light drizzle, but a real downpour, as a result of which everything was soaked. Ellie took her usual clothes with her, but for the parade and coronation, she bought a special outfit, a stunning white mini dress. Unfortunately, the heavens opened suddenly, and in the blink of an eye, Ellie was completely soaked. Her beautiful dress, made of a delicate material similar to linen or cotton, stuck to her wet body. She was standing on a platform completely open to the public. I pretended not to notice anything and quickly ran off the platform. Noticing an elderly man's raincoat nearby, I grabbed it without hesitation. I hurried back to cover it, but the glossy enamel paint of the platform made it dangerously slippery in the rain. Despite my best efforts, I slipped and fell off the platform while putting Ellie's raincoat on. Lying on the wet grass below, I couldn't decide which hurt more, my pride or my body. I was sitting on the wet grass, torn between my body and my pride. Too embarrassed to go back upstairs, I watched Ellie sit on her throne and accept the crown and scepter without even looking in my direction. A wide smile graced her face, making it graceful and beautiful. But I couldn't get rid of the feeling that she was laughing at me too. When the rain stopped, we were walking around the territory. Her dress dried up and stopped being transparent to others. Everything was as I expected. My brown Levi's were stained with grass, and my t-shirt was dirty. She looked like the city princess she was, and I looked like the city idiot. We went to the games and back, stopping at places where you could eat beef and french fries. I treated her to a meat patty, cake, and ice cream. When I took her home, she thanked me with a kiss on the cheek. In a way, it was like a date. After the problems with the car, we continued to walk and enjoy simple entertainment. We watched movies, had picnics, swam in the park, and ate hot dogs. I treasured this summer, considering it something special. But towards the end of the season, Glenn appeared, who took Ellie on dates every night, making me feel invisible. I despised Glenn Evesham for that. When the clock showed 11.50 p.m., I realized it was time. How did I convince Ellie to marry me? It was like a miracle. As everyone knows about lone wolves, so I was a loner in love. Some animals become strongly attached to one owner, 
and remain faithful to him all their lives. That's how I've always felt lonely when it came to relationships. Although I've dated other girls, I've never been able to get rid of the feeling that they're not right for Ellie. While some men fantasize about movie stars, my thoughts have always been with Ellie. It seems that all men have their own dreams, and for me, Ellie has always been in the first place. There were two sides to Ellie, the conquering hero and the suffering hero. It didn't matter to me which one of them was which, because in my eyes she was always perfect. Her name was Ellie, and I couldn't believe she'd agreed to marry me. It was then that I was happier than ever. From the end of our first summer vacation until our senior year, Ellie and I had a relationship that flared up and flared up. Due to the fact that I was limited in funds, our dates were always on a budget. We loved events like demolition races, tractor haulers, carnivals, apple festivals, minor league baseball games, the state fair and horse shows. Ellie had a deep passion for horse riding, considering it more a religion than a simple hobby, and I shared her love for this sport. Ellie has had her own car since she was a child, but I've never been able to afford it. But Glenn had a car too. Yes, I took her to church with me at every opportunity. Maybe it was a budget date, but I wanted to show her my character. We both belong to the Methodist faith, and they say that all Methodists like to sing and eat. I can confirm that Ellie has a wonderful voice. Now that we're married, she sings in the church choir and looks angelic in her attire. I can only hope that I will be as blessed as she is. I proposed to Ellie in the fall of her senior year, when she had already graduated from college and started working for a local software company. She traveled all over the area, repaired broken computers, and even started creating her own programs and games. I am not the best person to ask for an explanation about technology, as I have made my position on it clear. At the same time, Glenn, who constantly annoyed me as a student, was a senior at the University of Pennsylvania and was often absent, and this pleased me. Upon returning home, Glenn immediately asked Ellie out on a date, to which she readily agreed. I couldn't get rid of the feeling that I was always in second place. Glenn did not return home from Thanksgiving empty-handed. He brought with him an amazing woman named Masha Ashcroft. With long blonde hair, beautiful breasts, an incredible figure, and captivating brown eyes, Marsha was truly attractive. Glenn proudly introduced Marsha to his family and friends, confidently stating that he planned to marry her. We all congratulated the happy couple. Ellie kissed Glenn and Marsha, and I did the same. I shook Glenn's hand until they left, and then I got down to business. I finally felt that Glenn Evesham was really out of the game. Now it was my turn. Despite having other guys, I was sure that I was now Ellie's number one choice after Glenn. Determined, I went to the mall. I bought a ring and prepared my offer. I decided to do it in her family's house. It was a big modern house with a beautiful basement in the form of a club. I planned to take her downstairs and ask her a question. Since her brother was in school, I assumed he wouldn't be home. On Friday night, I called Ellie and convinced her to come downstairs to play video games. She always liked to win, so it was easy to persuade her. When we went downstairs, her parents and brother were upstairs. We returned to the playroom and settled down on the couch in front of the big TV. I knelt down and took out a tiny ring box, opening it to reveal the ring inside. Ellie, I began, but she interrupted me. Surprised, I hesitated, fearing rejection. Well, I... Ellie grabbed me and pulled me onto the couch, telling me to kiss her. That's what I did. While we were kissing, she started undoing the buttons on my shirt. By the time our first kiss was over, she had taken off both my shirt and t-shirt. I put my hands on her hips while she kissed me, fully clothed. After a few more kisses, she leaned back on the couch and looked at me intently. Well? she asked. I bent down and kissed her again feeling like I was in heaven. Suddenly, her brother started walking down the stairs. After going down three steps, he heard Ellie's loud voice. Vernon, come back upstairs! Her brother's name was Vernon. Then her father's voice sounded even louder. Vernon, come back! Ellie pulled me towards her, unbuckling my belt and jeans. 
We were sitting completely undressed on the couch in the playroom in her parents' basement while mom, dad, and brother were upstairs. I distinctly heard their conversation. On that unforgettable night, I became a man. At the age of 21, I finally became a man. I had never been with a woman before that night and remained innocent. It was a truly magical evening that I will never forget, and I believed that she felt the same way. We walked slowly together, exchanging kisses, hugs, and touches. Gradually, we began to explore each other's bodies with our hands and then with our lips. Although I knew she was not innocent, that evening she managed to convince me otherwise. Looking back, I realized that she may have been as nervous as I was. In the literature, this is often called contact, but I wanted to call it something else. For me, it was love pure, sincere, unconditional love. Ellie whispered softly in my ear, expressing her desire that I make her feel like a woman. I wondered if she could somehow read my mind. When we lay together, our bodies intertwined, we just snuggled up to each other. I showered kisses on her face and head, and she caressed my body with gentle hands. After a while, we both sat down. Ellie's expression turned serious, and she asked to see the ring. I found my trousers, took the ring out of the box, and handed it to her. She held out her left hand, or at least I think it was her left hand, and told me to put the ring on her finger. When I did this, I couldn't help but notice that the diamond, although small, just over a quarter of a carat, seems to shimmer and shine in the soft light of the table lamp. She examined her hand, then looked at me, and I decided that this was the end of our relationship. She explained that no one else exists for us. I was puzzled and asked for clarification. She looked at me sternly and stressed that now it would be just the two of us, without outsiders. I realized that she was the only one for me all this time. I expressed my feelings to her, admitting that she was my everything. She smiled back. I had the same feeling. I didn't quite understand what she meant when she said, for her too. Even now, I'm still not sure. After getting dressed, we went upstairs to her parents. Ellie proudly showed them the ring, but their reaction was more relieved than joyful. I used to think I knew why, but now I'm not sure. And that was the beginning of everything. Now Ellie and I have officially become a couple, and we are proud to share this news with our friends who admired her ring. Everyone, including Glenn, was delighted with us. A magical moment happened in November, when we were young, madly in love and unaware of possible problems. She had a solid job that allowed her to work remotely, and I was doing well in my studies, specializing in mathematics and education. Thanks to the exceptional math teachers and my strong academic and athletic background, getting a teaching position in the district was an easy task. Our wedding was scheduled for June, but soon there was a slight hitch. If two lovers regularly make love without protection, pregnancy is an inevitable consequence of this. In mid-January, we found out that we were expecting a baby, and this forced us to postpone the wedding to March. Our daughter Jenny was born in July, around the same time I started working as a math teacher at a county high school. In addition, I was asked to help with the preparation of the girls' soccer team at this school. When I looked at my watch, it read 11.55 p.m. It won't be long before my world, filled with dreams and fantasies of a blissful future, will be destroyed. My Ellie will soon come face to face with Mr. Big Shot Glenn Evers. I read her letters and knew that she was waiting for him. These letters were driving me crazy. Why did she leave her email open? Why didn't she protect it with a password? She had secret accounts and passwords that I didn't know anything about. This shouldn't have happened. Did she leave them open on purpose? Did she want me to understand? Was she really that unhappy with me? Was I really such a bad husband? I tried my best, God knows. Despite our financial difficulties, I tried to compensate for them in other ways. I devoted myself completely to her. I assured her of my love every day. I tried to give her everything that money couldn't give. Was it our closeness? I consider myself a good partner, but I have no other experience to compare it with. 
Ellie is the only woman I've ever been with. I'm not kidding. Ellie is the one I love the most. I have never harmed her or done anything to embarrass her. I always try to be strong and gentle with her at the same time. After watching a movie with Meg Ryan, I learned how some women can pretend to have real pleasure. With Ellie, I can tell when she's horny. I always try to focus on her pleasure. There were times when she was not in the mood to make love, for example, when she was stressed because of Jenny and Craig, who was born three years after her daughter, or when her back hurt. At such moments, I gave her a massage to ease her discomfort. I like giving her a back massage. I feel a connection between us. She means everything to me, and I pray that nothing will change that. Am I really not coping with the role of a father? Jenny is already three years old, and Craig is just a baby. Of course, I can sometimes raise my voice, as all men do, but I do my best to be near my children. I read Jenny bedtime stories and take her for a walk, trying to create the same memories as my parents. I try to be a good father, one that others admire. I try very hard to work around the house. I cook dinner, wash dishes, take care of the lawn, help with flowers, and use a vacuum cleaner. I am always ready to help her with whatever she needs, because her happiness is important to me. When Ellie is unwell, I try to be close to her. I don't run off to the tavern or anywhere else. I show my affection by kissing her often and cuddling up to her when we go to bed. Recently I came across Ellie's secret account, which aroused my curiosity, but did not arouse any suspicions. I opened the message and immediately regretted it. Glenn that scoundrel, had the audacity to ask if he could see her. Stating that he missed her and was lonely in his marriage, he was looking for someone to confide in. I couldn't help but think about what a snake he was in the grass. But then I read Ellie's answer. She gracefully asked him to step back, reminding him that she was married and busy. She advised him to talk to his wife or consult a psychologist if he was really unhappy. He kept sending her emails, constantly whining and begging her to pay attention to him. He claimed that he needed someone and that she was the only one who truly understood him. Despite her resistance, he persisted. Eventually, Ellie's behavior changed. She began to think about how they went to school and how much fun they had before he got engaged to Marcia. She started discussing their past, not including me, which eventually caused pain in my heart. Glenn suddenly appeared in the doorway of the motel room. I narrowed my eyes while sitting in the car so as not to catch his eye. Why am I so worried? I'm just across the street in the parking lot. Watching him closely, I noticed how he looked around before entering room 45. He went out for a moment, then took out his cell phone and called. I suspected that he was talking to Ellie, informing her of his whereabouts. Panic seized me. I was afraid that my life was unfolding before my eyes. I prayed that Ellie wouldn't come. Why was I so worried? I saw the emails she sent and it was clear how excited she was about it. She has already shown signs of betrayal, whether in her actions or just in her thoughts. If she doesn't do it today, she'll probably do it in the future. It's hard to read her words on the screen, but seeing it in reality is even more heartbreaking. It's almost noon now, and that moment is approaching. For me, a parent of two children and a third on the way, this situation is especially difficult. Yes, Jenny was born in July, three years and two months ago. Craig made his debut last October, and recently Ellie mentioned that she missed two periods. Three children? Three children by a dishonest, unfaithful woman? No, I shouldn't say that. Ellie would never do that, but here he is. He's standing over there. And all because of these letters, these damned letters. I wish I hadn't looked at them at all, although I must give her due. At first, she resisted. Then she became intrigued, and now she is discussing his wife, Marcia. Ellie persistently reminded him of his wife, asking questions like, What about your wife? And why do you want to do this to her? She urged him to talk to his wife reminding him that Marcia loved him and deserved to talk. Despite Glenn's excuses that his wife did not understand him and he had never loved her as much as Ellie, 
Ellie continued to defend Marsha's interests, arguing that she was faithful and deserved better. Ellie fought for Marsha, not allowing Glenn to ignore his responsibilities to his wife. She couldn't have handled this task better if she had been Marsha herself. But in the end, it didn't change anything. Last week, Ellie finally gave up and agreed to meet with him, and now we're here. My marriage, my life, and maybe Glenn and Marsha's marriage will end soon. I want to make it clear that I did not ignore this situation. I discussed it with my father, who shares my belief that when a man and a woman agree to get married, they give their hearts and souls to each other. The most precious thing in my life is with Ellie now. I want her to know that I don't want to control her, but she also promised herself to me. She declared that there was no one else for her, and her heart, soul, and body belonged to me, just as mine belonged to her. I will not tolerate betrayal or deception. I am ready to provide for her and our children financially, even if it means living in poverty. I refuse to be deceived. Looking at my watch, I saw that it was already 12.15 p.m. Glenn has already come to the door three times. I can't help but wonder if Ellie is running late. It occurs to me that maybe she won't come. If she doesn't come, I'll tell her about the letters. I'll try to make her see, understand. We can consult a psychologist. My love for her is immense. I'd rather die than be without her. I have always been faithful to her, and I cannot imagine life without her. Ellie's absence is like a slow death. I beg her to stay at home and not show up. But what if she does come? I already know the outcome. If she shows up, it will be the end. I refuse to accept it. I'm going to leave. We're going to have to get divorced. I will not live as a weak, powerless person. It's not in my nature. Please, Ellie, don't come. Time passes and it torments me. I have to find a solution. I have to make a call. I quickly dial Ellie's number on my mobile phone and she picks up the phone after just one call. Hi, it's me, Wyatt, I say. What are you doing now? Where are you? Ellie answers. I'm home, Wyatt. Jenny's in the nursery, Craig's sleeping upstairs, and I'm ironing one of your shirts. After a moment of silence, Ellie asks, Where are you? Shouldn't you be in class? I say emphatically, No, Ellie. I'm in my car right now, parked in front of the Piccolo Motel. I see Glenn Evesham coming in and out of room 145. It looks like he's looking for someone. Are you sure you're home? There is a brief pause on the line before Ellie replies, Yes, I'm home. Wyatt, please hang up and wait there. I love you. You know that I will never do anything that could harm you or our relationship. Trust me, just be patient. If you notice anything suspicious, call me right away. Now put down the phone. I followed the instructions and hung up. Good, I thought, giving her freedom. The second hand of the clock continued to tick. It was 12.30 p.m. Something happened at the piccolo. What could have happened this time? I watched as several people came to the door of room 145. One of them was Marsha Haversham, but I couldn't locate the other man who was carrying something under his arm. He started knocking loudly on the door, making me cry out in surprise. Glenn opened the door, and the man handed him a bulky envelope, after which he said something that I did not hear. Curiously examining the contents, I watched as Marsha stood silently behind the man and then they both turned to leave. Glenn quickly followed his wife, leaving me perplexed about the mysterious package. I was at a loss for what had just happened. Feeling the need for more information, I called Ellie again. She quickly picked up the phone and asked what I had witnessed. I told him that I saw a man handing Glenn a stack of documents while Marcia was present. I also told him that I saw Glenn chasing his wife in the parking lot. Ellie asked me to give her interpretation of the events, to which I hesitated a little before answering. Eventually I came to an understanding and asked Ellie to confirm my thoughts. She explained that what I saw was the end of a troubled marriage. I felt perplexed. What do you want to say? You can leave. Please come home, my dear. I'll explain everything to you as soon as you arrive. I decided to take the day off and immediately went home. When I arrived, Ellie was already waiting for me there. When I entered the house, I saw Ellie's mom loading our young children into her minivan. We exchanged greetings before I entered the house. 
Ellie took my hand and led me to the couch, which was actually an old one from her parents' basement. It was the same sofa that she had once given her very innocence to, the one she had given me a few years ago. Have a seat, my love. I sank down on the couch as Ellie knelt in front of me. I'm really sorry, dear. You shouldn't have come across these letters. I'm afraid that's where the whole misunderstanding started, she admitted. I didn't want to, but I couldn't help but read them, I confessed. Ellie squeezed my knee slightly before continuing. Let me clarify. A few weeks ago, I started receiving emails from Glenn. He expressed a desire to meet with me and his intentions were quite clear. I nodded understandingly. I did my best to dissuade him, she added. Despite his persistent letters, I came up with a plan by contacting Glenn's wife, Marcia. They have been feuding for a long time because of Glenn's shortcomings as a husband. Ellie, sensing my concern, reminded me that I was not like Glenn. When I tried to comfort my wife by leaning closer, she gently pushed me away, continuing that Marcia needed a reliable partner, not someone who was incapable of commitment. Together, Masha and I found a solution to their marital problems. What you have just heard is the exposure of a double deception. Masha and I have been receiving his letters at the same time for the last few weeks, but Marsha answered them, not me. I leaned closer. Let me explain, dear. Masha and I organized all this. Marsha doesn't want to hurt him. Why would that be? His financial support is very important to her, but she wants to leave. She dreams of finding a partner she can rely on and love. We've discussed this before. She needs someone like you. Today you witnessed Marsha's exit visa. I'm sorry I didn't mention this earlier. It just didn't occur to me that you would find it important or believe my love, that we were talking as one. I'm already working on conceiving our third child, Braxton. I was furious and upset. I was ashamed and embarrassed. Ellie, all my life I felt like I was in a secondary position to you. All the years you spent in high school and college, it seemed that Glenn always held the number one place in your heart. I was constantly on the sidelines, afraid that I had lost you because of him. When Ellie got up and started unbuttoning my shirt, she spoke fondly about me, calling me a smart and wonderful person. Remembering my school days, I wiped away a tear, remembering the stupid football games and lacrosse games we went to. I hate football. I hate lacrosse, I confessed, feeling nostalgic for the past. Lacrosse seemed uninteresting to me, but football was even more boring. Do you really believe that I went to every game for four years out of love for sports? I was there to support you. I still remember the moment when our eyes met during the game. Haven't I always been watching you? I held back my tears and nodded in agreement. Yes, I guess so, I replied. Ellie went on to recall our first official date. You organized everything flawlessly. A wonderful restaurant, tickets to the cat show. Everything was as it should be. When your car suddenly stopped, my heart ached. I wanted to hug you because you looked so vulnerable at that moment. My father admired your willingness to accept his help, understanding the emotions raging in me. Stroking my cheek, Ellie said softly, You were wrong, Wyatt. I've always loved you. You've always been in the first place for me. Do you remember carnivals? Do you remember when I was crowned queen of our city? You were both brave and awkward. You tried to give me a raincoat, but you ended up falling off the stage. It was silly but charming. Every girl in town wanted you, but only I was lucky. What about you and Glenn at the prom? Ellie pulled off both of my shirts and unbuttoned my trousers. Do you remember that? You were there the night I lost my virginity. It was on this very couch, Wyatt. It's always been you, no one else. I moved over to help her take off her pants. Your parents were at home that night. What kind of event was that, Wyatt? Do you remember the night you gave me the ring? She raised her left hand, and I nodded back. Do you remember the look on my parents' faces, Wyatt? Yes, I remember, I replied. They were full of joy. It was a mixture of happiness and relief. We've all been looking forward to your return for three years now. Since you left for college, my parents and I have been discussing this. For a while, it seemed like I would have to ask you to do it myself. 
But in the end, you took the initiative. When my brother started down the stairs, they realized that my brother was not paying attention and quickly intervened. Wyatt, my feelings for you have always been strong. Starting from elementary school, middle school, high school, and even when you left for college. But Wyatt, your actions have often been puzzling. So what's the plan now? I asked. Ellie leaned back in her chair and replied, As soon as I'm done here, we'll go upstairs, make love, get dressed, and then we'll go to my parents for dinner with chili. And after that, we will live happily ever after. That's the plan.